breaking ball away ball one Kilgus with a record of six and ten and with the Cubs in a pennant right he would like to change those numbers high pop fly back ashore going out as Domingo Ramos playing for Sean Dunstan and the wind makes it a foul ball out and of course the wind a decided factor the temperature in the 70s yesterday got into the 40s early this morning and it's 50 degrees at game time. Domingo Ramos the shortstop for the Cubs today in place of Sean Dunstan Dunstan out with some minor aches and pains has to fight the sun a little bit here at Wrigley Field very cool today at Wrigley <laughs> to say the least 70 70 some odd degrees yesterday where you woke up this morning and it was totally different no balls and two strikes they counted Jay Bell who checks in with a six game hitting streak. Bell not only six straight, 12 of his last 13, and it looks as if he is finally the answer to a pirate prayer at shortstop. He has started 46 straight at short. He was the opening day shortstop, but he was sent out to Buffalo for some seasoning, and apparently it worked. One and two. And he gets himself a base hit, so he's hit in seven straight. A defense for the Cubs today they boast the fourth best defense in the National League White Smith and left Marvell win in center Andre Dawson good speed in the Cub outfield Luis Salazar Cubs got him from the San Diego Padres in the Chiroli trade Domingo Ramos at short Sandberg just solid as a rocket second base Mark Grace at first and the young Cub catcher today Joe Girardi runner aboard with one out and Jeff King at the plate King Playing first base against a left hander. One ball and no strikes to count. King is an extra base threat. However, all five of his home runs this year have been coming against right handers. So he's looking at left hander Paul Kilgus, who has six wins and ten losses. That's a strike. One and one. One of the reasons that Zimmer went with. Oh, Kilgus today, a left hander, the wind blowing in from the left field to right field. He felt that the Pirates would use basically a right hand hitting lineup and would have to hit into the wind. There was some talk earlier about Scott Sanderson might start today, but then they said, well, you yeah, have you turn the entire Pittsburgh Pirate lineup around and they have a number of switch hitters, and then you get the left hand bats in there, can take advantage of that wind over toward right, toward right field. Sanderson has allowed 16 home runs, so that had something to do with he'd it. He'd be a risk. <laughs> yes. As saying, Scotty will pitch possibly Monday in Montreal. For the Cubs trying to clinch, they're going to finish their last six games on the road three in Montreal and then three next weekend in St. Louis. A drive to right center. Marvell Wynn trying to run it down, but it's to the wall. On his way to third is Jay Bell. He's waved in as the relay gets away from Sandberg and Ramos throws to third too late. Sandberg tried to short hop the throw from right center and came up empty and that gave King the extra base. So the extra base threat is just that as he drives in Bell. You can see the drive to right center by King. Here the ball goes away from Marvell Wynn. The ball, the ball will be blowing from right to left. The wind will have a definite effect on the ball today. Ryan Sandberg, who has made only six airs all day, will have to see if he gets charged with the seventh, and the Cubs will now be forced to play their infield in, even here in the first inning. And that was it. That short hop effort by Ryan Sandberg will cost him the error to break his string after 82 straight games without an error. Manny Trio had the record at 89. Though it is a double, an RBI, and an error charge to Sandberg. The throw right under Ryan's glove as he tried to short hop it. One ball and one strike to count. Slow curve in there for a strike, and the count one and two. And wait a minute. If we still have that play on tape, they are going to give the error, whether you want to call it favoritism or otherwise, they're going to give the error to Marvell Wynn. So Marvell Wynn, who made the throw, is going to be charged with the error. 
Meanwhile, Bobby Bonilla is caught looking, and down he goes. Take a look at the throw again from Marvell Wynn. He's going to play it off the ivy. It's a low throw, and it looks like Sandberg tried to short hop and just came up empty right there. And yet they're giving Wynn the error. We did the same thing yesterday here on a ball hit to Bobby Bonilla. They initially gave him a hit. They reviewed the film yesterday and then gave him an error. So the official score, it looks like, took a, took a peek at the instant replay and changed his mind. There was a short uh, short hop and very tough play for Sandberg. Air should have been probably on Marvel Marvel win is exactly right. One ball and no strikes the count to Gary Reeders with a runner third and two down and the Pirates leading one to nothing. A lot of pressure on the score whenever you have someone in pursuit of a record and the official score Bob Rosenberg looking at the tape and then giving the air to Marvell win on the corner for a strike. You could see the effects of Don Zimmer the manager of the Cubs in the very first inning with one out in the first inning still had his infield playing in knowing that with the wind blowing in you're going to have a low scoring game. You want to cut the other run off. A drive to center and Marvell win with the wind fooling him and the wind cut it down. That wasn't his fault at all. The wind is now blowing straight in and that's the reason why Reedus winds up at third. A bizarre twist but the wind had been blowing from left to right. It is blowing straight in and when that ball was hit if you were Marvell Wynn you had to turn your back and go towards the track. But when he turned around the ball had been cut in half. Now he's turning and whoops he's five ten feet short. So charge that to the wind. That ball normally would have been off the ivy in center field to show you how dramatic a change it can have on the ball hit up in the air here. Well, I mean it just knocked it straight down. So a tough break for Marvell Wynn and now Andy Van Slyke with a chance to pick up yet another run. It is two to nothing Pirates here in the first inning. So Jeff King doubled in Jay Bell. Now Gary Reedus, a windblown fly ball goes for a triple. One and one to count to Andy Van Slyke. For the Pirates it's a day in the park and for the Cubs a vital game. One ball, one strike. That's in there, one and two. Van Slyke has been a hot hitter lately, hitting over 400 against left handers. Eight of his nine home runs, however, have come from right hand pitching. In fact, his only home run against a left hander was against Bob Ojeda. Wild off. Still one and two. Did they get Reed as a hitter or no? Oh, triple all the way. Three bases. Official score <laughs> busy in the first inning, isn't he? I'll tell you one thing if we do have the league championship series, between the Giants and the Cubs. The wind will be a tremendous factor in each ballpark. Both places, yeah. exactly right. One and two. And that's a shot right at Mark Grace, and that saves a run. So Ryan Sandberg's streak is in the first inning. on worn shocks and struts. They can allow your tires to lose contact with the road, resulting in a loss of control and braking. Get a new set of Monroe Gasmatic shocks and struts. They help your vehicle hold the road. Hey, I feel safer already. So do I. For a smoother, safer ride, America rides Monroe. We're going to the bottom of the first inning at Wrigley Field. The Pirates leading the Cubs two to nothing. Surprisingly, a bare armed Bob Walk. Now, remember, it was 50 degrees when this game started, but Walk pitches the way he wants to pitch, and he's not worrying about the weather. He is worrying about a groin pull, however, and he starts ball one. He was a doubtful starter. He was forced to leave his last start because of a strained right groin, which caused him to leave in his previous start. One and one to count. When they sent Bob Walk to the bullpen to warm up, they were saying they didn't know if he could pitch and they were going to start Randy Kramer but Kramer had been bitten by a bee. So they weren't really sure who was going to start ground ball to Bonilla with 34 errors. He doesn't want number 35. One down. 
Bobby Bonilla big guy having big problems at third base. Bonilla with 34 errors on the year he made an error here yesterday which was costly for the Pittsburgh Pirates a good recovery there there is talk about Bobby being switched next year he be going back to the outfield originally with Pittsburgh and then over to the White Sox and then back to Pittsburgh fine offensive player but yet still looking for the defensive position that suits him best. Here is Ryan Sandberg whose 82 game airless streak is still alive. He takes ball one. There was question here Monday night against the Mets. There was a pop up with a couple outs and Sandberg dropped a ball. It was ruled a hit. Heads up in the wind. That means anybody is eligible and it'll be Jeff King. Two down. The question whether the pop up that he dropped should have been an air or a base hit uh, playing at home sometimes is a factor with the local scorekeeper. Yeah I was surprised I, if you didn't want to give Sandberg the error when he tried to short hop the throw you could have just forgotten about the error completely instead of pinning it on Marvell Wynn. I think the runner had stopped at second base so you have to give him credit for going to third somehow the air has to be a, applied somewhere and they've Special scorer felt the shot the short hop was just too short for him to handle. Yeah, like Sandberg, you expect him to make it. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure you do. Here's Dwight Smith, the young left fielder. And you know, when you look at the Cubs, they've played a lot of people in left field. And they have all contributed. So that the totals for the left fielder for Chicago, 283, 17 home runs, 73 runs batted in. 2 nothing Pittsburgh in the first inning. Breaking ball in there. Bob Walk all by himself might be a factor in the National League East when you look at his record. 0 and 1 against the Cubs. Four wins and no losses against the Cardinals. 2 and 2 the count to Dwight Smith. Two out in the first inning. The Pirates leading 2 nothing. But no lead is safe normally at Wrigley Field, and especially today with this wind. It is treacherous. Shot up the middle. Base hit. So Dwight Smith, hard single up the middle to bring up Mark Grace. You talk about the rookie of the year in the National League, it's probably going to come number one and number two from the Chicago Cubs. Jerome Walton. This young man, Dwight Smith, hitting over 300 most of the year. We talk about a manager coming along and finding two young players to fill in for him. Dwight Zimmer must feel like he's found gold. Here's Mark Grace now, two out, and Dwight Smith standing at first. Smith has stolen seven out of ten, so they'll keep an eye on him. With the first baseman, Jeff King, holding the corner, the right side of the infield is open for Mark Grace. Grace has been getting on base a lot of late. He has good numbers anyway at 316, but he's also walking a lot. He has almost twice as many walks as strikeouts. And in getting aboard, he's been carrying a lot of runs home. Outfield straight away, but the wind is angling in from behind left field. Pirates got two in the first inning. The Cubs trying to come back. The Cubs have beaten the Pirates 10 out of 16, winning four of seven here at Wrigley and winning six of the nine at Three Rivers. The so Bob Ward keeping an eye out on Dwight Smith as he takes his lead. Walk is trying to win his third in a row. He was the first Pirate 10 game winner back in August. Last year he was the Pirates first 10 game winner. One ball no strikes. Ball two. Pirates who have nowhere to go but home to finish the season have been playing well of late. They've won seven of their last 10. There are five games above 500 in the month of September. So Jim Leland, whose club was ravaged by injuries for most of the year, has an optimistic look about 1990. Fouled away. Jimmy Leland talking about the injuries that you talk about.
about Vinny. He says it just showed the lack of depth that we have in town and in the organization. They had a good year last year, made a small run at it, a scare against the New York Mets. But with the injuries that they have had, it just points out how shallow we are. I think he's wrong. I mean, I think he's wrong in directing his attention to his own organization. He says how shallow we are. What it really means is how shallow baseball is. In other words, you can't, there isn't a team in baseball that could lose an Andy Van Slyke, a Mike Lavalier, and a Jim Gott, and come right back and find replacements who are equal in talent. No way. There isn't a team around like that. The only one that might have a chance would be the St. Louis Cardinals with what Whitey has done. Mm. Two and one. Boy, Bob Walk is really intent on tying up Dwight Smith. I think he's a little bit concerned in this ballpark when the wind blows in or the wind blows out. It's really two different kinds of ballpark. Two different games are played. When the wind blows in like this, you don't expect to have a high-scoring game. The Cubs have stolen 130 bases. They can run the bases well. Fly ball to left field. The wind will cut that down considerably. Bonds has to come up to get it, and the Cubs wind up with just the base hit by Dwight Smith. So Bob Walk goes back to the dugout at the end of an inning, leading two to nothing. By Dan Bellardello and then Bob Walk. Paul Kilgus, who was victimized by the wind in the first inning, it cost him one of the two runs. 0 and 1 to count. Breaking ball skids in there nicely. Strike two. Leaned earlier this year had the longest hitting streak by a pirate. He had hit in 11 straight. And if he gets aboard, he's a definite threat to go. A fly ball to right field. Dawson coming to the line. One away. So we'll watch those two very, very carefully. Dan Villardello behind the plate against the left-hander. So Lavalier with the day off. Right. On one. Cubs are happy to see Villardello or Lavalier with the day off. He's just absolutely killing the Cub pitching. One ball and one strike to count. Villardello up and down. Returned to Buffalo when Lavalier was activated and then eventually called back up again on the 1st of September. Two and one to count. If you joined us a little late, with one out, Jay Bell singled up the middle. King doubled up the alley with Bell scoring as the relay got by Sandberg. And then Reedus hit a fly ball that was cut in half by the wind and it went for a triple. So it is two to nothing Pittsburgh. We're top of the second inning. The Pirates had two winning streaks of six straight. They had one losing streak of seven. And they have played a lot of tough ball games, which really points up the absence of Jim Gott. For instance, the Pirates have lost a half a dozen games this year when they were leading after eight innings. They lost nine games when they were leading after seven innings. They've been in 20 extra inning games. behind Bellardello three and one and threw two pitches and both of them looked like they were out of the strike zone. Not much discipline by Bellardello. Right on the borderline maybe too close to take. Three and one pitch was a changeup way out in front of it. He pulled off a fastball there. Bob Walk is a good hitting pitcher has always been a good hitting pitcher. Fouls that one right back into the seats. He comes in with nine runs batted in. And he has piled up 13 hits. So he's a threat. I think he's left handed. <laughs> you mean because he's not wearing that long sleeve shirt? No, he kind of marches to his own drum. Oh, he's, yeah. uh, he's flaky like many left handers are accused of. <laughs> he was. Uh, None of them are present. When he first came up. No, I know what you're telling me. <laughs> when he first came up to the big leagues and he was pitching at Dodger Stadium and he said, I'm probably the only pitcher to have been kicked out of Dodger Stadium before I ever pitched there. <laughs> and he was, you know, a bunch of kids in the bleachers and they got rowdy and he was kicked out of the out of the ballpark. And so he came back as a big leaguer. Two and two to Bob Walk. And he gets a hold of one in the alley. 
However, again, the wind playing, and it'll be the middleman, Marvell Wynn, making the catch. So the wind giveth, and the wind taketh away. And at the end of an inning and a half, Pirates 2 cut on top of the world right now, and well he should. According to his contract, he could have had a buyout for next year for $150,000. Or the Cubs had a chance to renew it for another $2 million. And the Cubs opted yesterday to renew for 1990 for over $2 million. Well, two. I don't think they want that question mark over his head as we go down the last week of the series. And certainly the Cubs, hopefully, the playoffs and World Series, they got that question mark out of the way for Andre so he could simply concentrate on baseball. Chopper to shortstop, and that's where Jay Bell is. One away. Well, Dawson has meant and continues to mean so much to the Cubs that it just adds to the story and the good feeling here in Chicago about each and every member. Andre Dawson will be back. Luis Salazar, who came over in the deal that sent Calvin Chiraldi to San Diego. Salazar joins a long and distinguished list of major league players who hailed from Venezuela. Going back to Luis Aparicio, Manny Trio, Davy Concepcion, Cesar Tovar, Vic Davo Leo, Tony Armas, Bo Diaz, Chico Carrascal, and Luis Salazar. One ball and one strike to count. Salazar has been swinging a hot bat for over two weeks now. Squirts that one wide at first. Hesitation by King, then the throw to walk in time. Good play by Bob Walk to handle a hard throw. Go play for the pitcher to get into position to cover first base. And you see the ball off the end of Salazar's bat. Pitcher's got to break right toward the bag and the throw perfect right in front. Timing. And the bag is supposed to be right there. It's one of those things you work on in spring training time and time again. You say, God, we have to do this again. And yes, you do. Every day you do that in spring training, so it becomes just a matter of habit. One ball and no strikes to Domingo Ramos. Bob Walk leading 2 nothing here in the bottom of the second inning. Ball two. Ramos playing for Sean Dunstan. If you happen to watch last week's game, you might remember you saw Dunstan dive for a ball, get up and rub his right shoulder, go into the dugout and rub it some more, but he stayed in the game. His bicep on his right arm has been bothering him for two weeks, and finally yesterday he had to come out of the game, and Sean said to Zimmer, I need a day. So today's the day, and he figures to play tomorrow. Looks like he was enjoying his day. Yes, <laughs> it was a restful day. A restful day in Chicago. A nice cool day not to play, but he made some play yesterday. He went in the hole. I mean, you would never know that he did anything like us or hard. He went in the hole deep at shortstop, turned in the air and threw to first base, and almost got Jay Bell at first. I mean, if it had been an astroturf infield, the ball would have scooted on the first and been out. It was an incredible play. Boy, he's quite a kid. He's hitting over 280 now. He has come of age for the Cubs. Three and two the count to his backup man Domingo Ramos with two out in the second two to nothing Pittsburgh half swing they're going to check it first swing and they break the news to Ramos I can't believe it in several languages you don't have to be the judge he has been judged and found guilty by Jim quick and we'll be back after these messages from your local station behind Barry Bond. Bonds fouled out to Domingo Ramos his first trip. Bonds has played a lot of ball. He has missed three games all year. Two balls and no strikes. And he's piled up some pretty good numbers although there are most people who figure that he is just starting that 254 average not high enough for him yet. Drives one in the right field corner foul. We showed you earlier a couple of American League games are going and Minnesota has just knocked off Oakland five, as we saw 3-1 in the seventh inning. 
Now it is 3-2, top of the eighth. Oakland with four pitchers who have won 17 or more. First time there's been a team like that over in the American League since Baltimore in 1971. A drive down the right field line. Dawson coming to the bricks. Between the foul line and the wall down the right field line. Very small area of foul territory down that right field line. As you get down into the corner, it becomes a matter of inches. You can see the foul line right along the ground. There's a gate down there, and that is but maybe six to eight inches between the foul line and the wall. It must be one of the toughest calls in baseball for an umpire. Even if you are straddling the foul line, looking down into that shaded area, and if a ball gets down there, it is literally a question of an inch, whether it's fair or foul. Jay Bell singled up the middle. He's hitting seven straight. Good-looking young ball player. Bell followed by Jeff King. Hard ground ball, base hit into left field. So Bell is center field. King obviously a feast or famine hitter early in his career. He has 37 hits. And 20 of those 37 extra bases. He has 13 doubles, three triples, five home runs. No average to talk of, but he can hurt you as the Cubs know. One ball, no strikes. For Paul Kilgus, it is hard to believe. I mean, he's starting a game that is so important in the pennant race. His last victory was the 25th of July. Dick Pohl talks about him and says for him to be effective, he has to get Pirates to swing at the ball early in the count. Runner going, ball hit up the middle, fielded by Ramos, safe at second, got him at first. Jimmy Leland putting the hit and run on here with Bell on first and King at the plate, just a roller at that ball. Been hit and not have the hit and run on, have been just a one, two, three, bing, bing, double play, but the hit and run keeps the Pirates out of the double play. Boy, what a good play by Ramos mm. to keep his balance and make a good throw to first. Bobby Bonilla, the batter, jammed and pops one up into shallow left. And Ramos with Dwight Smith hollering him off the ball. So Bonilla, the big guy, is jammed and pops it up. Good luck, but uh, Zimometer telling that Don Zimmer is at 190. Nothing mean and hungry about him. Strike one. 0 and 1 the count to Joe Girardi, then Paul Kilgus and Marvell Wynn. Girardi has had a few timely base hits. That's one of the big stories here, how the Cubs have rolled along, losing the services of Damon Berryhill. Berryhill, a switch hitting catcher, hitting 340 right handed. And when Barry Hill went down, it figured to affect the Cubs. But Girardi and Rona have done a fine job keeping them afloat. One and two. Cubs trying to play catch up. One of the strengths of the Cubs is their depth of their catching. Barry Hill who lays claim to the number one spot. And then Rona and Girardi, you would think over the winter they will make a deal. And they can deal from strength. A lot of clubs looking for catching. Two strikes to count. Nice choice, you know. You just say, well, who are we going to keep and which ones do we want? Just to have a surplus of talent when other people are looking for that exact same talent. Jobber foul outside a third and down the line. We duck in a score. Philadelphia, and of course, tremendous interest on that game. Philadelphia leading the Cardinals 1 0, bottom of the third. There's no Barry Hill catchers. There's no Dunstan at short, and there's no Walton in center. A shot up the middle into center field. So Girardi opens up with a base hit. Let's get for Don Zimmer. The Cubs are a very aggressive team. If you followed them at all this year, you get that feeling. They not only lead in batting average 260, but to point up their aggressiveness, 
they have the fewest walks in the league. One reason Dawson and Dunstan just don't get too many walks. They're up there hacking. He tried to bunt. Down he goes. Their aggressiveness comes from their manager, Don Zimmer. As men with the bases loaded, he will squeeze at any time, as you see. Koga's trying to bunt the look like a split finger pitch going out of the strike zone. But Zim has really played this game this year by his own book. And he will go with his intuition and he will go with what he feels the strength of his players are. He's worked for him so far. Here's Marvell Wynn who grounded to third in the first inning. Off speed and away. Ball one, one and oh. How does it feel to be Don Zimmer, a guy who's gone through the wars and is now this close? And he has said several times and said it again today. You know, if we win, I won't know how to express it. I won't know how to put it in words. A drive in the gap in right center field, and that's going to head for the Ivy. Joe Girardi is to third. They're going to send him in. Lean throw to the plate. He scores. Down to third goes Wynn. between Vance Lyke and Redis Chuck Cotty a very aggressive at third base the third base coach talked about the Cubs who will utilize their speed utilize their aggressiveness this is a ballpark with the wind blowing in you say you're not going to get many opportunities to score a run let's take our chances and utilize the speed and get on the scoreboard and that's the way that Zimmer has approached this game Marvell win the infield is up and Ryan Sandberg taking ball one Pirates two Cubs one bottom of the third Sandberg in his career has had some big numbers most home runs 26 prior to this year both managers Thinking very much the same way here with one out. Jimmy Leland has his infield in, knowing that they expect a low scoring game, even with Sandberg, who has excellent back control. You give him more opportunity to scoot the ball through the infield here. One ball, one strike. And it's hammered to left. Base hit, the ball game is tied. It's two in the first inning, and they have come back to even it up as Ryan Sandberg drives in Marvell Wynn. For Sandberg, his 75th run batted in, which points up another thing about the Cubs. They have three fellows with RBIs in the 70s. They do not have a hitter with 80 RBIs. Dawson has 74. Sandberg now has 75. And Mark Gray, 76. Dwight Smith singled in the first inning. Right. Ryan Sandberg may not win the most valuable player award in this league this year, but he will get a lot of votes for second and third spot. He has had a marvelous year for the Cubs. He represents a go-ahead run now with one out, third inning and a 2-2 tie. Bob Walk has been two pitchers statistically for Pittsburgh a much better pitcher at home than on the road he has been just a break even pitcher on the road and his earned run average away from three rivers is over five oh and two the count to Dwight Smith Bob Walk knows pressure he's pitched in some big games in 1980 he pitched in the World Series in fact he pitched in game one for Philadelphia 1982 he pitched in the league championship series for the Atlanta Braves and last year he was in the All-Star game but he's been through the mill and he came off the bag Sandberg unable to stay on the bag and John 
Kibler right there to call him picked off. But again, Rhino comes back in. Does he get on the bag and come off? Does he not reach the bag? You can see his toe just barely came off the bag as he seemed to lose his balance. Boy, and Jose Martinez didn't lose any time going after Kibler. So he's gone 0 and 2 to Dwight Smith ball one one and two. So in the inning Girardi singled with one out Wynn doubled him in and took third on the throw Sandberg picked him up only to be picked off and the count two and two to Dwight Smith. The Cubs will be playing their last home game of the regular season tomorrow. And then they'll finish on the road in Montreal and St. Louis. What makes this an important game just as yesterday's was a very important game the Cubs had to beat Doug Drabeck and he gives them a bad time but they were able to do it tomorrow the Pirates will pitch Jeff Robinson against the Cubs and Robinson is four and oh lifetime Dwight Smith trying to walk off that foul ball and it's two and two. Smith going after the split fingered and right down on top of his foot it looked like ouch he's already wearing the brace on the shin give him some protection and that's slapped into left center field for a base hit remember Bob walk was physically questionable at the start of the game with the groin pull and he is now given up four hits in the inning in a 2 2 tie. That pickoff of Sandberg becomes a very big play as Mark Grace checks in at the plate. Grace flied to left in the first inning. So Sandberg, alone with his thoughts, will see just how big that pickoff play is. Mark Grace, when you see him blowing on his hands, you can understand because he does not wear a batting glove. In fact, he might be the only hitter I know of in this day and age who does not use a glove. Personal preference, and that was close. John Kibler, the crew chief, having some very close calls. strikes Montreal trying to stay alive Hubie Brooks a former Met who has been saying he's going to be a former Expo has hit a grand slam to put the Expos in front that was supposed to be Frank Viola and Mark Langston quite a matchup there goes Smith the pitch off speed and low he's stolen it the throw is going to go into shallow center and Smith will move to third Smith has stolen eight out of 11. Stolen base number eight for Dwight Smith. The throw going up the line, just tailing away. It had been on the bag, and Smith would have been out. Good heads up. Base running by Smith. As you see him, he goes into the bag, and he looks for the ball. The ball went away from shortstop Jay Bell, and he knew that he could get to third base. Good base running, aggressive base running by Smith. 3 and 0 the count. Boy, that is just simply the way the Cubs play, and Zim has this ball covered, and they've been playing that way all year long. They fall behind in games, but they just continue to apply the pressure to the opposition. It's more of a mental attitude and a mental approach that Zim has that he's applied to these Cubs. That's his strike. Bob Walk with a runner at third it bears consideration. He has committed seven wild pitches. And he's also had four balks called, and Jimmy Leland's gone out. I wonder if he's going out talking about what to do with Grace. He's going to Eric Gregg first, because of this warm up tosses as he wants. But Don Zimmer is incensed. Zimmer's point is how can this man, meaning Leland, come running out on the field and make a pitching change under these circumstances after he has faced five hitters, given up four hits, and a three and one pitch to the third baseman? 
And he's saying that that's not right. He should have had a guy warming up in the bullpen or make walk finish pitching to the hitter, I'm sure. Leland, meanwhile, just sits quietly. But we all knew a long time ago that Walk was a questionable pitcher, and I'm sure Zimmer did too. So he's a little ticked off about the delay. I think the Zimmer being upset is understandable, sir. Right side that Bob Walk had here today. I went out there for the bottom of the sixth inning. Couldn't pitch. I, I couldn't get reach. Well, I could pitch. I just couldn't get it to home plate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Well, Walk tried anyway. But now the count three balls and one strike. So and Randy Kramer doesn't look like a guy who is expecting to pitch. He's bare armed unless he's right out of the Bob Walk school. Ground ball to the right side on the grass is lean to take care of him. So Kramer makes one pitch and gets grace. The Cubs wind up with two runs four hits and they leave him at and at the rooftops surrounding Wrigley Field. Meanwhile, Gary Reed is Andy Van Slyke and Jose Leend will try to test Paul Kilgus. Off speed and miss. Ball one. One and oh. Gary Reed is hit that fly ball at first looked like it was going to carry to the warning track. The wind cut it down and it went for a triple. Reed is comes into this game a hot hitter. He's hitting about 350 in his last 19 games. One and one to count to Gary Reedus. Ball two. An update on a very important ball game. The Cardinals have turned it around. They're leading Philadelphia three to one bottom of the third. Remember next weekend the Cardinals host the Cubs. Pop fly into shallow center. It will be Sandberg. Any ball hit in the air is an adventure here today. That ball ended up Marvin down the left field foul line. So it really is confusing. You can see that even Sandberg hesitated momentarily on that ball. I mean, that looked like it was going to be dead center field, and maybe Marville Wynn would have to come in a couple of steps and make the play. That ball was just 10 feet on the outfield grass. Two balls and no strikes to count to Andy Van Slyke. What a pitcher's paradise. <laughs> you know what I was wondering about? Of course, they're letting the pitchers blow on their hands today because it is that cold. It was 50 degrees at game time. It was in the 40s in the early morning. But it's very hard when your hands are cold to grip a ball because your skin becomes so slick. I would think anyone asked to throw a ball here has some extra pressure. Lack of moisture on yeah. the hands. The tactile sense becomes when you get the moisture on your hands, and that's why you can blow on your wait a minute your fingers. The tactile sense. Tactile sense. That's oh. when you touch them. Yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, babe. <laughs> Two down. That's the way we used to talk in the bullpen on the campus at SC. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The tactile sense. The tactile. Regular season game of the week. And it looks like it'll be a tremendous finish. Toronto Blue Jays and the Baltimore Orioles and the Chicago Cubs against the St. Louis Cardinals. It all begins with Major League Baseball and inside look. That's hit foul down the line out of play and the count of 1-1. One, one. Top of the fourth, a 2-2 two -two tie. Jose leaned the acrobatic second baseman. He's developing into quite a base dealer. He is 14 for 14 this year. And Kibler has not allowed the strike, and the crowd doesn't like it. They thought that Leand had committed on the bunt. One and one. You can see the bump attempt. He did pull it back. Of course, Kibler had called Domingo Ramos out earlier in the game, the same kind of situation. One ball and one strike. Foul ball, one and two. Lee not only perfect in stealing bases this year, you carry it over to last year, and he is 16 for 16. So that's something to keep in mind if he gets on base. One and two the count. Paul Kilgus trying to win his seven. Locked up 2 2. Ball two. 
the Cubs have done what they've had to do in the sense they have beaten the teams they had to beat. The Cub record 15 wins and only four losses against the Mets, the Cardinals, and Montreal. All three. So three and two to Jose Lean with two out in the fourth inning. The Cubs have lost four out of six in Montreal and won four out of six in St. Louis. So Lean is gone as on the Bucks. One, two, three. And at the end of three and a half innings, the Pirates two and the Cubs two. I can't. There's even an 800 number, but it doesn't work if you're in the in the state of Illinois. But the fever is here. The Cubs trying to make the city and the state forget all about 1984 and 1969. They're trying to get back to 1945. We will see if they will make it. You know, this is a different club than they had in '84, Vinny. In the sense that it's a ball club that can win. Ball games when the wind is blowing in here. That 84 club, they had more of home run hitting ball club. This ball club is a combination of speed and power, a better all around ball club. Best road team in the National League, probably. It proves that they can win at different types of stadiums, different surfaces. They can beat you with speed, they beat you with pitching, they can beat you with power. Or Zim talks about MVP. He you ask him about it, he'll name everybody on his ball club. Well, that's up in the air, which means it's up in the wind, and let's see where it winds up in the stands. So that makes it a hitter's day in many ways, especially with the lack of foul territory. And any ball that's even hit into fairground becomes questionable as to whether it's going to be caught or not. Witness the first inning on the fly ball by Gary Reedus that looked like it was going to go to the wall. As usual, the wind a factor here at Wrigley. Andre Dawson grounded to short in the second inning. He's 0 for 1. <laughs> 0 and 2. That's Randy Kramer pitching now for Pittsburgh. In case you joined us a little late, Bob Walk, to his credit, even though he was hurting, Walk realizing the importance of the game, he didn't want to miss his turn. He gave it his best shot, and finally the groin pull took too much, and Bob had to take a walk. And here's Kramer. Strike three to Andre Dawson. Let's go to New York. Another update from Gail Gardner. Luis Salazar, who grounded out in the second inning. Oh, he is a good utility player. A good pickup by the Cubs to get Salazar. He can play third. He can play the outfield. A veteran, smart player. Fists one in foul ground. Look out. Could have been a serious collision. The ball was not hit high enough. Randy Kramer tried to get over and direct traffic, but Kramer never could get where he could be heard. And King and Bill Ardello looked like they were going to go head to head. Kramer has to play traffic cop in that situation if he can. I remember we talked about Kramer having a bee sting. He was limping after the first inning that he pitched here, and that ball just perfect placement between King and Bill Ardello. It looked like neither one of them got enough help from the pitcher to be able to get there. You can see Bill Ardello take his eye off the ball right at the last moment. Well, you're talking about serious mm. injury. How about a knee right in the right on that jar or something there? Oh, boy, those things always oh, just scared me to death. Salazar broke his bat, so he had to get a new one. 0 oh, and 2 to Luis. And new or old, down he goes. That's two strikeouts for Kramer. Four strikeouts in the game against the Cubs, and the batter will be Domingo Ramos. You can see the fastball up and in. Louis just can't catch up with the ball. Two strikeouts in a row. Domingo Ramos playing for Sean Dunstan a strike he went down on strikes in the second inning he was called out on a half swing by John Kibler he couldn't believe it 2 2 bottom of the four fouled away whenever you have a dramatic change of pitcher especially in a pennant race you wonder about the fates being involved now remember walk was 0 and 1 against the Cubs and he had pitched so well against the Cardinals. 
now you have Randy Kramer who didn't figure to pitch. He has struck out the side. He has stopped the Cubs dead in the water and going into the fifth. Little foul ball that should go out of play and does. Don Zimmer jumped all over his pitching staff the other day. He said, listen, boys, we can't be in a pennant race and expect to win 9 to 7 and 11 to 8, 10 to 8. We need some games. You know, we win 3 to 2. We have our pitching staff win some ball games. We'll see Bill Ardillo go down on the strikes. It's in the third innings from Mike Balecki yesterday. And Kilgus working into his fifth inning already. Maddox has yet worked. He made everybody think about what we have to do in order to win. Yeah, we are in a pennant race, and we better. As a group, kick it in gear. His pitchers need a lot of help, and that's one reason why a lot of people felt the Cubs were a bad team. And there were some who said the Cubs would lose a hundred games this year. And when you think about it, there was pretty good reason. Kilgus going into this year was 14 and 22 in his career. Mike Bilecki had won 12 and lost 19 in his career. Maddox was a break-even pitcher, 26 on either side. But that's certainly not the kind of a stab you think is going to help you win the pennant. And yet that's what's going on. We don't know if there's a psychological warfare or not going on. You see this scoreboard now. If you've been watching our game, we've given you updates. You know that's not correct. I don't know whether they're just being slow on purpose, but this is really what's going on. That's it right up to the moment. But they have not put it up on the Wrigley Field scoreboard. Maybe they feel they don't want to put any. See, this is the way it is. 4-3 Montreal on a grand slam by Hubie Brooks. And the Cardinals are leading Philadelphia 3-1. But not as far as the good people here in Wrigley Field are concerned. They won't tell them that. You know it's psychological. <laughs> one and one to count. They'll wait until hopefully here the Cubs way out in front and then they'll put the scores up that will make their hometown favorites happy. By the way, the Cardinals are now leading seven to three in the fourth inning. Now you say, well, maybe they're just behind on the tape. No way. They've got the Minnesota final against Oakland. They have California Cleveland right up to the minute. But they are, they are obviously keeping things back as far as Montreal New York and well, especially maybe the Cardinal game. Maybe there's just one guy working out there and he's got to work all the way on the other side of the American League and then you know later in the day he's right. going to work over to the you other know, side. You're, you're absolutely Might be right. just one guy working on Saturdays here. That's what it is. Sorry it's not my <laughs> table. <laughs> two balls and two strikes. Those additional updated runs in other words we told you it was three to one quite a while ago. This score has just come over. 7-3 Cardinals. And now, now what they've done, they've put the seven up in the third inning. And the groan that just went up in the ballpark. Three and two. Brian Sandberg. Of course, understanding the background of the Chicago Cubs, the frustration, the pain, the anguish. America's team, that's how they feel about it here in Chicago. There's a lot of time and effort and expense into that sign. In fact, calling that just a sign would be an understatement. Meanwhile, the, they started with the Shauna meter, then they went to the Zimmer meter, and now there's a Cub -a meter in the magic number five. One ball and no strikes to Joe Girardi. Single score to run back in the third inning. We're 2 2, bottom of the fifth. Randy Kramer has struck out the side in the fourth inning, has retired the four batters he has faced. A last minute pitcher when Bob Walk had to come out hurt in the third inning. And he takes care of Girardi, and the count is one and two. We talked before about fate lending a hand. Two and two. Remember one year the Dodgers in a terrific pennant race. Bob Gibson was going to pitch, broke his ankle taking batting practice. So they were forced to pitch Kurt Simmons, and he beat him, and they went on to lose the pennant. And on a day like today, with the Cardinals leading and walk out and Kramer pitching and well, you begin to wonder about fate. And you wonder about fate. He comes in and mm. strikes out the side in the fourth. Three and two. Back. Throwing well too. 
he was hobbling. He came in the first hitter to the face of Mark Grace, grounded out to second, and Kramer had to break over toward first. And as he got over there, in case it was a play at first at the first baseman field of the ball, he was limping at the end, so he is bothered by that right ankle and a bee sting but two days ago. You forget, of course, that ball players, like all the rest of us, have to do certain things off the field. Like Rick Sutcliffe was bitten on the forearm because his Sutcliffe bitten by his dog. Kramer has been bitten by a bee. Mickey Hatcher of the Dodgers, I understand, heard a groin pull moving furniture for his wife. That's a strike. 0 oh, and 1 to Kilgus. That's how Neil Allen was out for the year. He's moving in front. The front fell on his pitching hand. He broke a finger. Then there was Bob Ojeda cutting the, the hedge with the That's scissors. Right. Oh and one. Kilga showing bunt. Throwback. Leaned is there, but no tag. One ball, one strike. Two two. Bottom of the fifth. Bobby Bonilla well in on the grass at third, looking bunt. And leaned is almost in motion, getting ready to cover first as King charges the plate. Two and one. I guess the one pitch you don't want to throw to a fella in a bunt situation is a curveball. The one pitch you don't want to throw is ball four. Mm -hmm. If a ball club is going to give you an out, and that's what the Cubs are going to do, you got to take the out. You might get it at second base. If you can hold a runner, there's a second strike. If you can hold a runner close enough at first, and give the hitter a difficult pitch to bunt. You might bunt it hard down to Bunny. You might bunt it hard down to the first baseman, Jeff King, and they can turn and get the lead runner at second. Girardi runs well for a catcher, remember. Two balls, two strikes. In the air. Bonilla doesn't have to catch it because Kilgus has struck out anyway. But officially, it's a put out to Bonilla. Listen, when you've got 34 air, Bonilla not going to let that one get away. <laughs> Feels good to hold on to one. Uh, the batter now will be Marvell Webb. Great natured guy and multi talented. Bobby Bonilla. Now here's Marvell Wynn, a Chicago boy. Grounded to third, double to right, one for two. On deck, Ryan Sandberg. One out, remember, Girardi at first, he bunts. Down to get it, Kramer. And the play is to King, who had an ice cream cone. Boy, was that ball sitting up on the top of his first baseman's mitt. Big play by Jeff King because Randy Kramer threw a sailor to first. You want to talk about what speed can do and what hustle can do and what attitude can do. Now, that was not a good bunt. A couple of hops right back to Kramer. Should be an easy play. Marvell went absolutely busted it down to first base. Don't take anything for granted. And it puts that extra extra added pressure on Randy Kramer almost through a triple down the right field line. So a big play by Jeff King and Ryan Sandberg with a runner at second and two down in the fifth inning. It's officially ruled a sacrifice although you know that Wynn with one out was certainly bunting for a base hit. And here is Sandberg popped up and singled one for two. Sandberg's base hit drove in win to tie up the game. Sandberg was then picked off and Dwight Smith followed with a base hit. So that was a big play when they picked off Rhino. Ball one. Here's the bunt play again and you can see Marvell win how he's busting it to first base. You say well that's just a routine out of first. That's the kind of play when he goes back to the dugout. Yeah, he made it out fine. He got his runner to second, but he's congratulated more for anything else. His approach to the game and his hustle. That is really appreciated by his teammates and more than anybody else by Don Zimmer. You could almost take an expression they use in tennis, forced errors. That was almost a forced error. Ball two, the count to Ryan Sandberg. Pirates two, Cubs two. Bottom of the fifth inning. The fall has arrived with a bluster last night maybe 40 mile an hour winds to drop the temperatures from the 70s into the 40s it got up to 50 at the start of today's game if you are fortunate enough to be seated in the sunshine it's not so bad but for those folks who are did I tell you that yes I yeah. remember that we brought that up once already too, <laughs> <didn't> we? <laughs> 
Two and all the count to Ryan Sandberg. Two two in the fifth. Joe Girardi who scored on a double in the third inning out there at second base. Three and oh the count to Sandberg. Dwight Smith on deck. Dwight is two for two with a stolen base. Situation here where the Kramer wants to pitch the Sandberg three and oh you got to believe he's swinging if he gets the pitch he wants. Three and one. Pitcher doesn't approach this as a cripple situation. You just have to go after the hitter with first base open. Sandberg hitting around 290. You have to go after it just as if the count is a two and two count. Ground ball hard to third. Bonilla gets his man. So with a tiebreaker rounding third, Bonilla throws out Sandberg, and at the end of five, two, three at the end of four innings. Strike. Jay Bell, two for two. He's hit in seven straight. Singled up the middle, single to left. Scored a run. Strike. They talk about Paul Kilgus, tired eight in a row, that he has to be just letter perfect to be effective. Trying to get the hitters to swing early in the count. He goes deep in the count. Dick Pohl, their pitching coach, said, told me before the game, he said he gets in real trouble. There's Dick Pohl, and he's done a fine job with his pitching staff. Question, the big question about Rick Sutcliffe. When is he going to be able to pitch? He's been hurting for a month. Great tender. He says he's pitching Monday. Don Zimmer says he's not pitching so he's healthy. And the doctor's going to check him again tomorrow. They, Slice foul. They had Sutcliffe on the gun. Recently in New York when he pitched and the gun had him at 83 miles an hour tops for his fastball. Mm. And that is a pitcher that when he's healthy goes in the low 90s. 89 90 91 and that 83 mile an hour zone that's right in the hitting zone because Suckless is not a sinker ball pitcher. He's a four seam fastball pitcher. Ground ball to shortstop. Domingo Ramos makes the play on Bell. One down in the sixth inning. A reminder for area, and it all begins at 12:30 Eastern with NFL Live. Here's Jeff King, double grounded out, one for two. So he had a key double to drive in a run and scored a run and made a very big play on the bunt by Win and what would have been a disastrous throw by Randy. Kramer and drives it to center. Win is there. And if you look up, you see that the flags are not flapping nearly as much. And Win can make that play. The ball earlier in the game that Win lost, he turned and took his. Is there. And if you look up, you see that the flags are not flapping nearly as much. And Win can make that play. The ball earlier in the game that Win lost, he turned. And took his eye off the ball this time. Never did he take his eye off the ball. That more of a line drive than the ball hit by King earlier in the game. But a lesson learned. Wynn just came over here on August 31st. Oh, almost got him. So, I mean, this is almost like playing in a new ballpark for him. And he has to go through the learning process himself. You can see the pitch to Bonilla. I mean, that's. You've got to think that that ball has got him before it gets by. Two balls and no strikes. The big third baseman has a nine game hitting streak. He struck out in the first inning and flied to left in the third. Ball three. Bonilla, another wearing the shin guard. In fact, the shin guard has now become de rigueur. You just have to wear it. We have now seen players play defensively while wearing a shin guard and run the bases while wearing a shin guard this year. They were good. They were good. Which falls into my tactical sense. <laughs> a fly to Sandberg. And the Bucks are done. That's 11 in a row retired by Paul Kilgus. They let Bonilla swing 3-0 and oh and he came up empty. Over the winning run and the Indians beat the, An the Angels 4-3. to three. It means California unable to take advantage of an Oakland defeat. Minnesota beat Oakland 5-3. So they stay four back and time running out. Kansas City playing tonight. Kansas City is at home with Seattle. They split a doubleheader last night. And 
they finished the season in Oakland. Well, they were looking forward to that. Cubs get down where they just cannot lose anymore. Montreal cannot lose another game. The Cubs' magic number is five. One thing for sure, they won't win it here at home. They go to Montreal next week and then St. Louis. 1-1, one, one, and that's low and inside. Ball 2-2-1. Two, two and one. Montreal right on the edge of being eliminated. Two balls and one strike to Dwight Smith. That's ball three. I was watching the news last night and the sport. Johnny Morris, who was doing the sports, was trying to explain to the newscaster, who was a female, what the magic number oh. meant and how you determine what the magic number is. <laughs> There's ball four to Dwight Smith. That's the second pass given up by Randy Kramer. And a game left at home, that's tomorrow. Then they play three in Montreal where they have lost four out of six and they finish up in St. Louis where they have won four out of six and that will be that maybe we say maybe because if there would be a playoff game that game between let's say the Cardinals and the Cubs since the Cardinals are closest would be here in Chicago. They had a, a telephone call and a coin toss. Here are the Cardinals. They have one more tomorrow with the Phillies. They go away to play the Pirates and come back to play the Cubs. The pitch is swung on and missed while Smith was in motion. And he's into second base with a stolen base. Mark Grace swinging to help the runner. He missed it and so did Bill Ardello. And the count one ball one strike. Smith had this base stolen even before Grace swung the bat. I mean, the ball was all the way by Bill Ardella before Grace made an attempt to. Smith had it stolen cleanly. It was going to be a no contest this time at second base. But Mark Grace doing his job, I mean, still trying to give the catcher as much trouble as he possibly could and trying to protect the base runner. I just think you could swing much later than that. Maybe that counts against the next pitch the pitcher's going to throw. The next at bat. <laughs> one ball and one strike. Good fastball in the count one and two. Randy Kramer picked up with a runner at third. Two out and a three and one count to Mark Grace. And Grace swung at Kramer's first pitch and grounded to Jose Lean. Since that time, there's only been one man reach and that's on walks. And Jim Leland now talking to Eric Gregg and down the line is Jim Quick. I don't think Eric Gregg's Jim Quick down from third base. I think it's just a matter of clarification. I That's don't think all. Eric Gregg saw the first swing. Now Zimmer's coming out and saying wait a minute what's the count. What happened Zimmer says. On the wild pitch Gregg so obviously that's it. And it wasn't a wild pitch remember scoring because the runner was in motion. I think what happens is Greg held up a two ball one strike count post pitch to Mark Grace and Leland's close to being kicked out. There's ball one. OK one ball and no strikes. Now in a minute you're going to see the second pitch and Leland is incensed and on the edge of being thrown out. But again he is so right that the umpires are taking it from him. All right, it's one ball and no strikes. Here's the next pitch. This is when the runner's going. See that swing? Okay. That's one ball and one strike. Now, here's the next pitch. Just as soon as we can rack up the tape. Leland is now leaving like a Philadelphia lawyer who might have won his case. Now he's coming back again. Here is the third pitch. Now remember the counts one ball and one strike. And here's the pitch. And watch Eric Gregg. That's a strike. So the count is one ball and two strikes and you can take that to the bank. On goes it ain't necessarily so. Ball three. <laughs> 
It's hard to say it. You're right, because it's not. It's not, yeah, but it is. is. You've got to think that the game is being played under protest. It's as hot as Jimmy is. Wow. If he can protest the game, he certainly would have. And the evidence is there. Three and one. And look out now. Instead of a one ball, two strike count, they turn it around to two and one, and he has the walk, which should not be. And the batter is Andre Dawson. Gee, that's too bad. It is such an important game. You would hate to have anything happen over such a, a mix-up. Leland is not going out. He's got to send no. his pitching coach out. Ray Miller is just going out to talk to Kramer to try to settle him down. Kramer, remember, foul and the count on one. You might say, how many times has Andre Dawson sacrificed this year? And the answer is what you might expect. Never. Zero. Two on, nobody out in the sixth. Dawson, Salazar, and Ramos in a 2-2 tie in the sixth inning. Don't be surprised if Zimmer puts on some other kind of running play here as opposed to the bunt. He will try to hit and run. He will do anything at any time. Baked by Kramer. 0-1 the count. Jimmy Leland is livid in the pirate dugout and understandably trying now to to calm down a little. No balls and one strike to Andre Dawson. That's off the plate and the count one and one. That was almost a semi pitch up. Leland will put on lots of plays to the bases trying to shorten up the runner's lead trying to see if he can get a clue on what the opposing manager is trying to do and that pitch out of the strike zone away one and one all right now the count is one ball and two strikes I think we're going back to basics here <laughs> three outs in the inning <laughs> well I don't blame him no I don't either and you don't do that and go back and sit on the bench and the amount of arguing that he did he would have been long gone Empire didn't know that he had a legitimate case. One and two. Half swing and down he goes. So Andre Dawson unable to advance the runners. That would be the fourth strikeout for Randy Kramer. One out and the batter Louis Salazar. Salazar has grounded out and struck out. Bob Patterson a left hander throwing in the pirate bullpen. Salazar 0 for 2. Kramer really has to watch these runners. Mark Grace standing at first has stolen 14 out of 21. Dwight Smith with a stolen base standing at second has stolen 9 out of 12. Ball one. You got to think that Zim's going to do something somewhere. He will put his runners in motion. He will utilize the qualities that the players in the field have. The only question here is contact by Salazar. Salazar struck out the last time up at fastball up and in. One ball, no strike. Pick off, but no throw. Lean to the bag. Kramer wisely electing to hold on to the ball. A 2 2 tie. The Pirates got two in the first inning, the Cubs got two in the third. A lost count in the sixth inning has really added to the situation. And the Cubs have two on with one out. The breeze has picked up a bit. And again, angling from left to right. Obviously, you keep the ball in. You're going to make the right hand. The hitters, hitters hit the ball into that wind. We've already seen the effect on the baseball two or three times already today. Another fake by Kramer. One ball and no strikes to Louis Salazar playing third base instead of Vance Law. Ball two. Talking about the win, I mean, that's definitely why Don Zimmer was starting Kilgus today and not Scotty Sanderson. 
Arden Kilgus, the left-hander, to make the Pirates put in their right-hand hitting lineup. A couple left-handers in for Pittsburgh today. All the rest of them right-handers hitting into the wind, coming out over that left field wall. And that's ball three. Three and oh the count. You're just trying to stare down at Eric Gray. And I'm sure in that big left hand is the indicator. You wouldn't be able to see it from this side. And that's a strike. Three and one to count. Would they dare play a thing like run and hit? Well, just to take that thought away, they try and take a step from Dwight Smith. Salazar, in checking his at bat, strikes out about a sixth of the time. The run is hold, and the ball is hit in the air to left center. Bonds, however, is there, and the runners go back. And that win cut that down because he hit it right into that crosswind. Two down, but it will determine Jim Leland's feelings about the inning. If Ramos makes out and the inning goes by, okay, they'll let bygones be bygones. If he gets a base hit to put the Cubs out in front, I don't know how Leland could stand it. Oh, and one the count. Ramos struck out in the second, struck out in the fourth. Big bouncer up the middle behind the bag is lean quickly to Bell for the fours. And so the messed up count does not haunt the Pirates. The Cubs leave two and we'll be back after these. As we go to the seventh inning on a cold day in Chicago, a 2-2 tie. The Pirates have not had a hit since Jay Bell singled in the third. The Cubs have not had a hit since Dwight Smith singled in the third. And now into the seventh. And you can see the left hand of Eric Gregg. And his thumb, I believe, is holding that indicator. Here we go. A strike to Gary Reedus. Reedus got a windblown triple in the first inning and popped up in the fourth. Gary won for two. One ball, one strike. I kept looking for that indicator in Eric Craig's hand. I thought for a while I didn't yeah. see it, but it, it's in it's there. In there. It's that, in there. It's a big hand. I think his thumb is just pressing it right into the palm of the hand. Either that or he has a ring that keeps it on his thumb. It might be mm -hmm. keep it there. They're trying to find an there. explanation. There you can there see it. There you It's just on his thumb. I'm trying to find an explanation for the missed count somehow, somewhere. They very rarely do the umpires look at him. It's so mechanical for them that they simply hit one of the three little levers on that indicator. That squirted foul, so it's still one and two. We have a couple of scores. First of all, a grand slam by Hubie Brooks. They were leading 4-1. The Mets scored six, and Montreal came back with two, and that's a wild one now. 8-6 New York in the eighth inning. Meanwhile, just starting, Giants leading Houston 1-0, and San Diego and the Dodgers just beginning. Field. The wind will move Dawson a little bit. The Reedus a fly ball, one down in the seventh inning. This is the only place where a routine fly ball, you never know what it's going to turn into. You can see Dawson, and that was just an absolutely fly ball to right. I don't know if the wind is going to gust and blow it to his left. Here's Andy Van Slyke, ball one. The late in the day here, and it is 3.30 local time. You have the wind, which has been with us all day, and now a lack of sunshine. The field pretty much in shade. But it's as clear a day as if it would break. You could see almost unlimited. A crystal clear day in the Midwest. Do you see the size of the waves on Lake Michigan today? And it made you think immediately about the stories oh. about Hugo with 17-foot waves. Incredible. 
that story you were telling me, the 70 foot waves, 10 miles in, inland. 10 miles into Fort Sumner. Yeah, right. Ball three, three and one. We have a 2 2 tie here in the seventh inning. The Cardinals are winning. The Mets are winning. And that adds to the drama here for Don Zimmer and company. Van Slyke lined out to first and grounded to shore. Now ball. And he had a big year last year, 25 home runs, over 100 RBIs. This has begun to be a forgettable year for him. He has just nine home runs and 52 RBIs. Injuries, of course, have just really knocked Andy back this year. Great year last year. MVP type year last year. Well, he just gets ball four. That's the first base runner since Bell in the third inning. And we'll go to New York to Gail Gardner for an update. Meanwhile, we're 2 2 in the seventh with one out after retiring 12 in a row. Paul Kilgus just walked Andy Van Slyke. He's facing Jose Lean. Les Lancaster begins to loosen up in the Cub bullpen. Bob Patterson has been throwing in the Pirate pen. If they get down to Kramer's spot, why, well, no doubt, Jim Leland thinking hitter. And now Bob Kipper has replaced Bob Patterson in the Pirate bullpen. Another left hander. There's Kipper. 0 and 1 to lean. Flied to right, grounded to short. Van Slyke with good running speed. And so they pitch out and almost got it over the plate. That's not where Girardi wanted to pitch out. He wanted it on his throwing side. And the ball winds up on his glove side. Watch this. He's moving out over there. Almost got away. One ball, one strike. Ball two. Van Slyke puts a lot of pressure on because he has stolen 16 out of 20. And Girardi wants to talk to his pitcher. Yeah, it's hand blowing time in Chicago. I think Zim would be more than happy if he could get seven innings out of Kilgus. Whether he's going to get that far, I don't know. It doesn't look like Zim's going to come out and make a double switch here. He's going right to Eric. Ball three. So it's. Oh, it's not rare, but it's a little odd that you would have two situations in this one game where pitchers have inherited counts. Kramer inherited a three and one count with Mark Grace. Lancaster inherited a two and one count. Van Slyke goes, and there's a base hit to left field. Van Slyke is on his way to third, and Smith started to go after him and then decided to go into second base. First and third with one out in the seventh inning. In a 2 2 tie. Dan Billardello will not come up. R.J. Reynolds will bat for Billardello. And for Paul Kilgus, he pitched so well and yet he could lose it because of a walk. So Lancaster greeted by a base hit by Jose Lean. And the switch hitting R.J. Reynolds coming up. Reynolds. Turning around to hit left handed and remember the wind is blowing out towards right. Reynolds in looking at his work during the year five of his six home runs have been hit as a left handed batter. For over two weeks R.J. Reynolds has hit about 315. Well, they are sending up a pretty hot hitter on this cold day with first and third one out in the seventh. In a 2 2 tie. You would think that Mike Lavalier would be the hitter for the pitcher, the number nine spot. Lavalier has just hit the Cubs like he has owned them. Put a helmet on, he went down to the bullpen to warm up. He will do the catching. I wonder why he is not hitting here. If nothing else, just not to hit in a double play. 0 oh 1 to count. Kramer figures to come out, and since they're going to need Lavalier, he would be due to hitting. He's now heading back towards the dugout. No balls in one strike. One out. That's probably the biggest single consideration. Why Reynolds instead of Lavalier? Double play. Double play. Stay out of the double play. Out. Yeah. Lavalier's had 
knee surgery and knee problems does not run well to begin with. R.J. Reynolds run like a deer. The only thing is, would you believe R.J. Reynolds is second on the club in grounding into double plays? He's hitting the ball hard right at someone. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, one and two. Runners at first and third. One out in the seventh in a 2-2 tie. Andy Van Slyke, the tiebreaker, down the line from third. Jose leaned away from first. And remember, leaned is 14 for 14 in stolen bases. So they have to worry about him. See about a hitter for Randy Kramer. We would assume that it would be Lavalier. Left hander gets up and begins to throw in the Cub bullpen. Boy, and R.J. Reynolds knew it. He just snapped that bad bat handle off. Eric Gray green him up on a pitch right on the corner. Lancaster just made a perfect pitch. And it wasn't that R.J. Reynolds is upset with the umpire. He knew that it was strike three and mad at himself or not. If nothing else, just fouling the ball off. Billy Hatcher is coming up to hit. Though so Billy Hatcher, who was involved in the deal that sent Glenn Wilson to Houston, and Hatcher went to Pittsburgh, so Hatcher will bat for Kramer and not Lavalier. I don't figure this one. The runner in scoring position at third base. Why would you put your hardest hitter against this ball club? There's a strike. 0 and 1. On deck, you have Barry Bonds. Remember, they batted for Bill Ardello. Well, they're going to need Lavalier. They got two hits here yesterday. Oh, and one. Check swing. They look at first. No swing, says John Kibler. Naturally, the umpires can't win here. Anything that goes against the Cubs will immediately get the booze. Well, they called one against. Domingo Ramos earlier, remember? The Cub fans will never let him forget that. Every call after that has got to be an equalizer. One and one. Check swing foul in the count one and two. Mike Lavalier, who has not had an at bat, is putting on the gear in the dugout, so he's going to be the catcher. He's hitting 333 with a home run and 22 RBIs. But he is not getting a chance to swing the bat. Lavalier is 0 for 1 as a pinch hitter this year. So it'll be up to Hatcher. One ball, two strikes. Got it. So Lancaster strikes out Reynolds and Hatcher, and the Bucks let a big chance get away. Here's a law, and Marvell win in that order, and left-hander Bob Kipper on the mound with Mike Lavalier behind the plate. We have received some phone calls naturally because of the disputed count. And there have been some people who thought, well, maybe Eric Gregg, the plate umpire, never saw Mark Grace swing at the pitch in the dirt since it was a wild pitch. Maybe Eric assumed that that was just a ball. We're going to show you the videotape after Girardi has had his at bat. And we would ask you to keep your eyes on Eric Gregg and see if he is not square to the mound and square to the hitter. And then you can make your own assumption. 0 oh and 2 the count to Girardi. 4 1, 1 and 2. Fortunately, that big rhubarb did not affect the game. That would have really been a shame. Hit foul off to the right and out of play. Bob Kipper with a record of three and four in his 50th game in relief. It's been Walk, Kramer, and Kipper. And Kramer was absolutely brilliant. He struck out four, did not allow a hit in three and a third innings. Even inherited a three and one count and got the hitter Mark Grace. Fly ball into left center field. 
the wind will cut it in half but the sun is out and the catch is made OK let's go back to the pitch to Mark Grace now watch Eric Gregg square to the mound the pitch is going to be in the dirt but Greg is still square there's the swing Greg is still square now if Eric didn't see it that would be a surprise but there's three other umpires out in front of him. How could he not see it? I don't know. He's looking right over the top of the catcher. Exactly. Never turned away. Hitter swinging right in front of him. Unless he for somehow, somehow, because of being a pass ball, and he backed away and saw the ball being chased down by the catcher, and all of a sudden, you know how they instinctively work the ball and strike on their indicator without even looking at it he hits the wrong button maybe that's you you were looking for an explanation why here the indicator is held in his left hand and if you also were looking very closely as Eric eventually turned away to let the catcher go in pursuit of the wild pitch he reached for his mask with his left hand which was also holding the indicator maybe somehow that also contributed to the confusion two and one the count of Ann's law Three and one the count. We're in the bottom of the seventh inning. Big game. The Cardinals have torn their game with Philadelphia to pieces now. It is St. Louis 11 and Philadelphia 4. They're in the bottom of the seventh inning. Fly ball into right center field. Reedus will put it away. Two down in the seventh. Win through to the cutoff man, Ryan Sandberg, who tried to short hop the throw and couldn't do it, and they gave Win the error, not Sandberg. It would have broken Sandberg's string at 82. Then Marvell understandably was fooled on a ball hit by Gary Reedus that looked like it was going to go about 390 and wound up going about 340, and it fell in front of him for a triple. We've had about four balls today. They would have been off the wall. Bob Walk, the pitcher, first time up on a normal day, if there is such a thing as a normal day at Wrigley Field. That ball hit hard enough for a home be a home run in this ballpark. It's only 368 in the alleys. And again, you think down the road, if it should come out to be the Cubs and the Giants, boy, will the wind play a major part in those games. If two and two. One of the things that has to be going through Don Zimmer's mind and Dick Poe's mind, the pitching coach for the Cubs, the rotation that he would have if in fact they do win this in National League East. Ground ball to first, right there to bring it to the bag is Jeff King. So the Cubs go quietly in the seventh inning. They haven't had a hit since the third, and we're locked up. Percy there rides the red cap of St. Louis. One and zero the count to Barry Bonds, who fouled to short, flied to right, and grounded to second. One ball, no strikes, and Lancaster, who struck out Reynolds and Hatcher after surrendering a base hit to Lean, is now on his own. Behind three and zero, Lancaster with a record of three and two, he has seven saves. This is 39th assignment. Pitched yesterday for Zim for a third of an inning. Back of Mike Malecki. and he walks Bonds, and for the Bucks, that's the first time that they have been able to get a leadoff man on base, and the man they get aboard can motor, and Zimmer knows it. Because Bonds has stolen 31 bases. The batter now will be Jay Bell. Bonds, as he stands at first, has reached the 30 stolen base plateau for the third time in his career. His first year, his rookie year, he stole 36. He has 31 right now. Bell showing bunt and gets it down. Charging it is Grace to decide to go to Sandberg and holding it second is Bonds and the sacrifice works. So the tiebreaker was left at third in the seventh inning when Van Slyke walked and reached third on the and Jeff King will be the batter. 
Talking about a rotation for the Cubs, if in fact they do get into the playoffs against the San Francisco Giants, given that the Giants win the first two games in the National League East, you would think that they would go with Maddox and Balecki. Between Maddox, Balecki, and Sutcliffe, those three have started over 90 games for the Cubs. There's a hopper to shortstop, backhanded by Ramos, who makes the play. Nice play, and it keeps Bonds anchored at second. There, Bobby Bonilla. We have a couple of scores we can drop in to bring you up to date on what's going around. The Cardinals chewing up the Phillies now, while the Mets leading Montreal 8-6. They've had home runs by Jeffrey Carter and Tuffle. In fact, Carter, not a home run. It was a two-run double. 1-0 the count to Bonilla. Gary Reedus, a right-hand batter coming up, so they'll just take the bat out of Bonilla's hand. So the intentional pass. The moment, two on, two out. Lancaster with two out, facing yet another challenge. He struck out Reynolds and Hatcher with a runner at third in the seventh inning. Zimmer simply playing percentages there, walking Bonilla at the right-hander against the right-hander. And on deck, Andy Van Slyke. Oh, and one. You think back, you wonder why in the world the value was not hitting in the seventh inning. Hatcher went up to hit, or R.J. Reynolds, either one, the way he has hit against the Cubs for the Pirates. Came into the game anyway. No balls in one strike. And there's a hopper to short, and Ramos on his knee makes the play. Domingo Ramos playing for Sean Dunstan makes two good plays in the eighth, and we're still 2-2. Two -two. With an end, Mark Grace in a 2-2 two -two tie. Sandberg popped up, single left to drive in a run, but was then picked off, and a base hit followed. So that hurt the Cubs. Rounded out in the fifth inning. So he is one for three. Down in the cup bullpen, Paul Ossenmacher and Mitch Williams, the two left handers heating up. And the Pirates will be backing up Bob Kipper with Doug Bear, veteran right hand. Right. One and one, the count to Sandberg. 30 home runs, and the wind blowing from left to right. Be interesting to see what kind of hitting Sandberg tries to do here. Tough to hit the ball out to left field with the wind blowing in. You wonder if he'll try to hit the ball up the middle. He's got to get on base. That's what his objective is in this situation. Be pretty selective as a hitter leading off here in a tie ball game going late in the late innings. Three and one to count. ball that's going to go out to left field is a line drive. Any high fly ball is going to get knocked down. Kipper not throwing anything on the inner half of the plate. High up fly on the right side in foul ground. And it's King in the sunshine. One away. We're in the bottom of the eighth inning in a 2-2 tie. The Pirates scored two in the first inning. The Cubs got two in the bottom of the third. And neither offense has been heard since. Dwight Smith singled in the third inning, and the Cubs have not had a base hit since. For the Pirates, they had Lean single in the seventh, and before that, you had to go back to Bell single in the third. John Kibler asking the ball boy, who is bringing some sunglasses, I think, perhaps, out to Gary Reedus. So, timeout. Just a few minutes ago, the field was in shade, and you were wondering about putting the lights on. The wind has been with us all day in varying degrees. Now it's bright and shiny again, except for a strip from home plate along third base and all the way down that left field line. One ball and no strikes to Dwight Smith. He's been on base all three trips. Single to center, single to left and stole second, went to third on an overthrow, walked and stole second in the sixth inning. And he has to count his way, two balls and no strikes. Came into the game hitting 314. 
Uno. Fisted foul or third out of play. Bonilla, Bonilla was really protecting the line against Sandberg. He moved in about even with the bag here. Now he has to protect against the bunt against Smith. Obviously, the Pirates do not want to give up a two base hit. Man, Jeff King is very deep at first, all the way back nearly on the grass. That's in there, and they count two balls and two strikes. Boy, that is just as deep as you could play at first base against a player that can run the way that Smith can. And he bangs it into right field. It's a perfect day. Three singles and a walk. And since he has already stolen two bases, he is certainly liable to try another. The difference being he'll have a left-hander looking at him as he takes his lead. Mark Grace will be the batter. Fly to left, grounded out, and won. So all eyes on Dwight Smith. He's stolen nine out of 12. Held on by Jeff King. A lot of base runners feel it is easier to steal on a left-hander than a right-hander because you can read them a lot easier since you're looking at them. You're looking right at them, and for the most part, it'll take a long time try to catch you leaning one way or the other. A left hand will take a long time in the throw to first base and a long time in delivery to home. So we have the battle. Oh, there's a balk. There's as balky a balk as you'll ever see as Kipper just lost control of it. We were talking earlier about in cold weather how serious a problem it is to hold on to the ball. And Kipper like a bar of wet soap in the shower. That thing just comes flying out of his hand. That'll make this week in baseball cinch. There is a good chance you'll see that replayed many places. I always tell a pitcher, don't squeeze the ball, just like they'll tell a hitter, don't squeeze the bat. You've heard the expression, don't squeeze the sawdust out of the bat. Pitcher, the pitcher can't do the same thing. You're not supposed to squeeze the ball. Boy, we'll see just how big a break that is. It takes away the force play. It puts the tie-breaking run in scoring position. And for a fellow who flies. You're not supposed to squeeze it, but you're supposed to hold on to it a little bit tighter than that. One ball and no strikes. The count to Mark Grace. Ball two. When you talk to the writers broadcasters have covered the Chicago Cubs and they say they just there's so many games that have the Cubs have won in just odd peculiar manners against the Giants they were out of pinch hitters they had to let less Lancaster hit he comes up and hits a double and they win a ball game three run home run by Mitch Williams the other day uh oh there goes Smith to third and it's fouled away and it would appear that he had a good jump Grace intent on a two and oh count didn't see him going. So Dwight Smith trying to steal third instead goes back to the bag and the count two and one to Mark Grace. I'm telling you Zim just will try to catch you napping at any moment. Fouled away off third down the line out of play on the count two and two. Jay Bell, the Pirate shortstop, trying to bird dog Dwight Smith a little bit and make him cut down his lead. But at the same time, with a contact hitter like Mark Grace, the infielders can't afford to be caught in motion, can't afford to open up the hole. And especially Grace, who will go to left field with two strikes. Amazing thing about Grace, almost 500 times at the plate this year, only 40 strikeouts. Two balls, two strikes. Just off the corner, ball three. Dawson waiting on deck. Well, you talk about a pitch that a pitcher will want. And then the pitcher will throw a pitch like that, and you say, how in the world can they take that? How can they let it go by and not even try to foul it off? Just off the plate. Three and two. And almost hitting ball. Since the third inning has been Smith's single here in the eighth and some walks. And now 
Here comes Andre Dawson. And Dawson is getting a standing ovation and wave. Almost a salam from many of the people. And here comes Jim Leland. Do you wonder if Jimmy comes out here, if he's going to wait until Eric Gray comes out. No, he's not going to do it. He nope. waved at the. I wondered if he was going to wait for Eric Gray to give him another piece of his mind. He's going right to Doug Bear to be the fourth Pirate pitcher. So Bob Kipper, who contributed to his own problems when that ball slipped out of his hand, the balk moving Dwight Smith, just missing on that three ball pitch to Mark Grace and then walking it. So Kipper is gone and Doug Bear the veteran will go in to go up against Dawson. Remember after Dawson you have the Cub pitcher Les Lancaster and the left handers Ossenmacher and Williams have stopped throwing in the Cub bullpen and Mitch Williams putting on his windbreaker Ossenmacher doing the same. So Doug Bear who has certainly been around Doug Bear has been pitching professionally since 1971 came to Pittsburgh in 1976 then he really moved around he went from Pittsburgh to Oakland then he spent four years with Cincinnati then three with the Cardinals then three with Detroit then back to the Cardinals back to Oakland stopped off in Philadelphia then Toronto for a spot of tea and here he is back with Pittsburgh again Doug Bear. Doug 40 years old and I've always loved it when he was with Cincinnati I remember he is from the perfectly named town for a relief pitcher Defiance Ohio I played with Doug in Cincinnati because you mentioned all the places that Doug Bear has played it's probably difficult for any major league player not to have at least at some point played with Doug Bear. <laughs> good fastball. Good hard breaking ball. Amazing that 40 years old and he can still get it up to home plate. Started in AAA this year and he tells a story that I couldn't make the big league club because I was too old. He said the only reason I made this Pittsburgh club was because the other fellow in contention was too young. So he finally got back to the big leagues for Pittsburgh. Well, he is in a big league situation right now with the Cardinals leading Philadelphia. 11 to 3 in the eighth inning. The Cubs are tied up 2 2 with Pittsburgh in the bottom of the eighth, and Andre Dawson with a chance to do something about it. Dawson has grounded to short, struck out in the fourth, struck out in the sixth. So two on, one out. Dawson over three. High foul off first base. The wind should blow it away. It does. Oh, and one to count. There's a ball on a normal day might come right back to the playing field. A ball hit by a right hand hitter off of that part of the ballpark will spin back. The rotation will bring that ball back in an arc, but the wind just keeps blowing that ball to the right. Oh, and one to count to Andre Dawson. One out, two on. Dwight Smith at second, Mark Grace at first, and they both run very well. And that's it in the air to right field. Here comes Reedus to make the catch. Throws to King. It is in time to double up Grace. The call made by the second base umpire, Gary Davis, because Kibler had gone down the line to make sure that Reedus was going to catch it. Here comes Gary to catch it at the belt buckle, but Kibler's out of the play. And Davis hustling over from second is right there to call the play and the runner. Wouldn't it be great if lawyers showed up to tell you that someone you didn't even know left you like eight gazillion dollars? Yeah! And wouldn't it be great if the lawyers brought beer? Really great beer like Keystone, the fresh cold filtered beer in a can that tastes like beer in a bottle because of Keystone's specially lined can. And wouldn't it be great if your boss called demanding information and you said call 411. <laughs> Introducing Keystone and Keystone Light, bottled beer taste in a can. Wouldn't that be great? It has arrived. <laughs> 
Good morning, Mr. Graves. This is the all-new four-door Cutlass Supreme. Your mission is to show the world that it's causing an automotive revolution. Its sleek look and responsive performance make it a superpower among world-class cars. This is not your father's automobile. Hey, head up! This is the new generation. change every day of the week. Burger King has 99 cent daily specials. A different sandwich every Monday through Friday for just 99 cents. At Burger King, you not only get change, you get change. For every man who wears Brute, there's a woman who loves what he smells like. Because there's something about Brute that's nice to be close to. Honey, I was just thinking about you. Brute, it smells like a man. It's 847. And Andy Cabana's father is learning all about his antifreeze. The hard way. Come on, Dad. Where are you? Don't push your luck. Guarantee it with advanced formula Prestone. We're going to the ninth inning at Wrigley Field, all tied up 2-2. The Pirates with Andy Van Slyke, Jose Lean, and then Mike Lavalier. Les Lancaster starts with a strike. This will be his third inning. You remember Lancaster came in and gave up the base hit to lean in the seventh and then struck out two and worked his way out of the jam in the eighth. Breaking ball and a chopper to short. Ramos on the move. One away. Boy, they haven't sure haven't missed Andre Sean Dunson today, have they? He's played well. Boy, he's super today. He looks a little bit facially when I look at him sideways like that. Reminds me of Ruben Amaro. Mm -hmm. Just Boy, like that. He's a what, a, what a luxury to have a fill-in like that. Whew. One down. Here's Jose Lean. Fly to right, grounded to short, single to left. The paid attendance today, 36,849, and they are really sitting in on a dandy. It's cold, it's dark again. But it's something. A shot into left field. So Lean goes two for four with his two hits against Lancaster. And especially now does he figure to perhaps do some running. Remember we told you he is 14 for 14 in stolen bases. And he's been successful 16 straight. So Jose Lean representing a tiebreaker. And here is Mike Lavalier. Lavalier, despite the fact he's hitting 462 against the Cubs this year, surprisingly was conspicuous in his absence as a pinch hitter back in the seventh inning. But now here he is in the ninth. But he could have hit with runners at first and third and one out, or he could have hit with runners at first and third and two out, but Leland opted to hold him back. But now here he is with a chance to hurt. Ball one. Jose Lean held on by Mark Grace. Vance Law playing right on the line against a left hand hitting the volume. All right, hits the ball opposite field very well. Marvell went way around at center field. Smith around in left field. Play him all the way around, almost like a right hand full hitter. 2 0, oh, the count of Mike Lavalier. Lavalier keeps staring down at third. Gene Lamont to see if there might be a play on. And Jose Lean, a very interested spectator over at first. Law is moving back. He was way in. Lavalier does not run well at all. Before Law was in, even with the He goes on a hit and run miss. The throw down. He is out for the first time this year. The tag by Domingo Ramos. Joe Girardi got one of the better base runners in the league. He got a good pitch to handle. It got him up out of the crouch he on got the a way. Great pitch to handle. Up and away. That's exactly where you'd want the ball. Credit Lancaster getting the ball to him in that position. And a very quick release by Joe Girardi. 
That's the key. He got a great pitch to handle. Good footwork and a good quick release. Good tag by Ramos. Second, he got the ball there quickly, and that's the key to that good throw by a catcher. Deuce is wild on Lavalier with the bases empty, and it's fouled away. Two balls, two strikes, two out in a 2-2 tie in the ninth. When the Cubs come up in the bottom of the ninth, Lancaster is due to lead off, then Ramos, and then Girardi. Remember we told you about the Pirates. They have been in 49 games decided by one run, and they've only won 18 of them. And there is strike three call to Lavalier. No run to hit and nobody left. And at the end of eight and a half, it remains 2-2 two -two in Wonderland. The Game of the Week has been brought to you by New Keystone and Keystone Light. Bottled beer taste in a can. Wouldn't that be great? By the new generation of Oldsmobile. Step into the future now at your Oldsmobile dealer. By Scope, the best thing first thing in the morning. And by Burger King, where you can get a great breakfast every day of the week. A reminder, join NBC Sports tomorrow, a great football doubleheader, beginning at 12.30 Eastern with NFL Live. O.J. Simpson will do a special feature on the Pittsburgh Steelers. Then some of you will see the Oilers, 89 home debut in the House of Pain, as they call it, seeking revenge against the Buffalo Bills, a team that knocked them out of the playoffs last year. In the second half of our doubleheader, the Raiders will battle John Elway and the Broncos plus regional action so be sure to check your local listings for the games in time in your area a little psych job out there the magic number is five but the fans are telling the Cubs you can reduce it to four but they have to get by the Pirates the Cardinals are not going to do it for them the Cardinals are leading Philadelphia 11 three in the bottom of the eighth inning we have a moment so let's check all the scores to bring you up to date First of all, Minnesota knocked off Oakland 5-3, but it didn't help the California Angels. Milwaukee leading Toronto 2-1 in the bottom of the four. Boston giving Detroit a bad time and beat them 6-1. In the National League, the Cardinals leading Philadelphia now 11-4, and they've moved to the top of the ninth. In a slugfest, the Mets now leading Montreal 12-6, top of the seventh. Montreal on the edge of extinction. San Francisco leading Houston 1-0 in the top of the fourth. And there's the game that you tie in with the Oakland defeat, a lost opportunity for the Angels. In game two, Cleveland is leading 3-1 in the fifth. Cleveland won the first game 4-3 on a bases-loaded walk to Brooke Jacoby to force over the winning run. And we go to the bottom of the ninth. Don Zimmer. A tough cold day in the yard. Jim Leland, beside himself in anger back in the sixth inning, has settled in now. And Curtis Wilkerson will come up and bat for Les Lancaster. Wilkerson, a switch hitter, much better numbers as a left-handed batter. Out away. On one. No balls and one strike to count. One ball, one strike. One thing Wilkerson doing what many pinch hitters will do, walking up there and hacking at the first pitch, bear a decent base on ball innings pitch ratio, about one to three. You don't look for him to be wild. Pinch hitters will go up and look for just one pitch. If they get it, they'll let it go. Two and one to Curtis Wilkerson, leading off matters in the bottom of the ninth inning. And now he has to count his way three balls and one strike. So Doug Bear. The fourth Pirate pitcher has been Bob Walk, who had to leave with a bad groin pull, Randy Kramer, then Bob Kipper, and now Bear. 
Zimmer has gone with Kilgus and Lancaster. And we're 2 2, bottom of the ninth. Ground ball hit slowly, leaving the bag was King, and so Bear can't handle the throw from Lean. And the winning run is aboard. Jeff King went wide and left the bag, and it was up to Bear, and Lean threw back of him a bit. On the 3 1 pitch, you can see King leaving the bag. It's the duty of the pitcher to get to the bag to throw behind Doug Bear. Still a makeable play. It's a situation we talked about a play that you work on a thousand times in spring training because it has to be executed from a timing standpoint perfectly. The throw just behind Bear, yet he still should have been able to make the play. The arrow will be charged to Jose Leend, however, since he did throw behind the pitcher. And now here is Domingo Ramos, and we'll see if he plays sacrifice. Bears off the rubber. Curtis Wilkerson has stolen four out of six. Ramos has sacrificed five times in backing up for Sean Dunstan. And after Ramos comes the catcher, Joe Girardi. He shows bunt and takes ball one. who has sparkled defensively struck out twice hit into a force play left hand to Bob Patterson throwing in the bullpen for Pittsburgh one ball no strike you got to watch the Cubs in this situation you just don't know what Zim will do Play by the book and go for pure sacrifice. He might steal, he might hit and run. It's variety. He shows bunt and he gets the bunt down. And Bears' only play is to lean. So on the sacrifice, the Cubs now have the winning run in scoring position with one out. And Girardi and Law do up. A final score just to put a little extra heat on cold Wrigley Field. The Cardinals have defeated the Phillies 11 to 5. Meanwhile, it looks like Zimmer is going to his bench. Mitch Webster coming out of the dugout to bat for Girardi. So Mitch Webster will be coming up. Cat and mouse by the two managers. Jimmy Leland looking at his lineup card. There's a left-hander in the bullpen. Of course, both clubs now, you understand, are playing with expanded rosters. The players up from AAA that they'd want to bring to the major league level. Not just playing with 24 players here, but an expanded roster for both, both ball clubs. The situation here, Leland may want to change pitchers. He may simply want to put Webster on first base, set up a double play situation. You got Law, the next hitter for the Cubs. Webster is hitting over 400 against Pirate pitching this year. So he's up there with a runner for a desperate ball club. Sandberg led the way. And then the little pop fly that might have been the final out for the Giants agonizingly spilling out of Robbie Thompson's glove and the Cubs were alive. And then the moment of truth, the ultimate confrontation. Cy Young winner, most valuable player, bases loaded, game on the line, and it was over. The Giants exulting in the high of victory. And the Cubs tasting the dregs of despair. He's behind the plate, and trying to stop that lineup is one of the great Cub pitchers of all time. Since World War II, second to Ferguson Jenkins, he won 135 games in the livery of the Chicago Cubs. He has not pitched well of late. One big reason, he had a strained right groin. And those who watch him carefully say it has definitely affected his sinker. He starts a strike to Walden. One of the things that Roger Craig and Norm Sherry will be concentrating on is to make sure Russell bends his legs. He's been pitching stiff-legged, perhaps the result of the injury. One and one. 
The word on Rick Reschel is that we will know very early if, in fact, he has his stuff, as you see his motion. One of the things he'll have to do is try to get down, as Vinny says, and use that right leg as much as he can. He tries to get great movement on his fastball. He may not strike you out with velocity. He may have four or five fastballs a day that might get the 90-mile-an-hour zone. But for the most part, it's a sinking fastball and a little breaking ball. The word on him in those is that if he doesn't have it, we're going to find out very early, and that's exactly the way it was when he pitched in Wrigley Field in game number two for the Giants. One ball and two strikes to Jerome Walden. Curve ball hit foul. For Russell, those who operate speed guns on him marvel with the same delivery, throwing to the same location. He can go from 90 to 78 miles per hour in a blink of the eye. And Walden that time way out in front and cracked his bat. He has to get another stick. And look at that. He dropped to 72 miles an hour on that 